Well, we, we've been talking about Riverfest here, haven't we, and how we had such a good time. And, 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 you know, we handed out water like we always do. We also hand out balloons, which is why we have uh, these balloons here today, and, uh, and I'll explain why. But uh, that was something new we did. But it, it's nice to get out and, and greet the people from our community and, again, show them different things, uh, s small things, to say, hey, we know you're here, we care that you're here, and we love you because Jesus loves you. But we decided to do helium balloons at, at the council a few weeks back in addition to the water. And I said, great idea. I don't know who came up with the idea. It wasn't me. But uh, we said, we'll do helium balloons. And I said, well, I'll get the balloons because I used to be in marketing and I know how to get custom made balloons. And I said, I'll get the helium because, well, we've done helium here before, right? And so I knew how to, who to go to and how to do that. And that's fine, right? Except for this time getting the helium wasn't as easy as it used to be. I called up our former vendor. No, the vendor we used before, and they said, oh, no, we don't do that anymore. I called several other places I thought might, might do rentals, and like, nope, don't do that. Finally had one of them put me on to a guy at Hoffman Auto Parts and Butler. Thank God for Hoffman Auto Parts and Butler. A guy named Roger, I called him one day, and he said, hmm, don't know if we can get that for you. Call me tomorrow. And at this point, I'm sweating because like, I already had all these custom-made balloons and no way to fill them up, right? So I call him the next day, and he's like, yeah, we can do that for you. We can get it for you. You can come and pick it up. Like, yes. And he explained to me the reason it was so difficult to get helium was because there, there's apparently a helium shortage. I mean, doesn't this sound silly? How is there a helium shortage? Helium is a naturally occurring element. I mean, it's plentiful. It's number two on the periodic table. A lot, you know, so it's there with all the, like, like carbon and oxygen and hydrogen and nitrogen and, and neon, all these things. So there's lots of helium in the world. How don't we have enough? It seems like a senseless thing, doesn't it? Well, apparently, mining helium is not cost effective to just go and do that in its own self. It's just way too expensive. So the helium that we have at our disposal is stuff that's actually a byproduct of some other industries. And as those other industries ha have slowed down, so has the production of this byproduct. And, and then the guy who rented me the tank told me Friday, uh, yeah, and, and the suppliers now, they hoard it. And it's like they're rationing it, and they give it to the people they want to give it to because it's a shortage, right? And so it's hard to get your hands on it. And he says, it drove up the price. Guys, we paid more than twice as much for that helium tank as we used to, uh, and so, which is why I said we got this helium, we're filling up all these balloons, right? We have these giant balloons we paid for, we're using them, and we're going to celebrate today and have this fun stuff, right? But it just seemed like a silly, senseless loss to me, right? Like, like uh, okay, you go to the dollar store, you used to be able to get helium balloons for someone's birthday or something, you can't anymore because of helium shortage. So we, we don't have helium for birthday parties or for fun things like parades. It's what a senseless loss. And that's what we talk about today, senseless losses. But you and I both know that often senseless losses in life are, are not as frivolous as not being able to get helium uh, for, for your balloons. Uh, some senseless losses are, 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 are just very painful. Aren't they? And it just, you're left asking, why? See, we've been talking uh, about... Uh, the tests God gives us in our lives, right? And, and the things that God allows to come into our lives, and he tests us in order to grow us to be more like Christ, to make us more righteous, uh, to, to, uh, to improve our character. And God wants us to pass those tests. He puts them in there to grow us in that direction. And so today's test we talk about is the test we face when we experience a senseless loss. Rick Warren, who I've told you is responsible for many of the ideas, foundational, and putting this, together this list of tests we've been looking at, he calls this the why test, uh, when you're just left asking why. Well, when, when you have a loss in your life and it makes no sense at all, it's irrational, it's illogical, and it doesn't make sense, and you're just saying, why God, why and this is often the ultimate test you will face, all right? Perhaps more difficult, more powerful in our lives than, than any of the tests we've been talking about thus far in this series. It certainly was a big one in the life of Abraham. Now, this is the fourth week in a row we've talked about Abraham and the life of Abraham. And I promise you, unless something weird happens next week, we're going to move on to Moses. But... Um, Abraham has still got so much stuff to teach us about uh, facing life's tests and, uh, as we grow to be more like Jesus Christ. So we look at him today because Abraham went through a trial that tested him to the core. 
and it had to do with the senseless loss. Something in his life, a loss that didn't make any sense. When God said, you heard me read the scripture, Abraham, sacrifice your son Isaac. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. There are a lot of things in life that don't make sense, right? We ask why, and we look for explanations, but so often we don't get explanations, do we? Because just a lot of times life doesn't make sense. And, and, and you can spend your whole life thinking, well, if I could just get the answer why, if I, I could just explain to me why or what's going on, if I could, then, I, then I'd be all right. Except for we wouldn't be, because explanations don't offer us comfort. Those of you with children, or if you just had a special child in your life, uh, what would you do if you went in your kid's room, and maybe you have to think back to when they were kids, one day, and one morning, and you just found that they, they, they've passed away without any explanation? And so since it's odd, before, before the body is laid to rest, the medical people, they come in and they do an autopsy and they explain to you why your child just suddenly passed away. They explain to you, you know, the physical reasons of why it happened. The loss is no less painful just because you have an explanation. It wouldn't make the pain any less because explanations never comfort. We think they will. But they don't. What you need when you are in pain, when you are dealing with a major loss, a senseless loss, you need the presence of God, not the explanation of God. Because the explanation will not make it any less painful. So, so stop looking for explanations. Stop looking for the why. What you need is simply God's presence in those deepest, darkest, most hurt places in your life. Are you experiencing when you have that, that senseless loss? That's where you need the presence of God. Because otherwise, you know, things in life just don't make sense. See, at, at 100 years old, Abraham had a miracle baby. We've been talking about this. Remember, God had promised Abraham, Abraham, go where I tell you, and I'm going to grow you into a great nation, which is kind of difficult to do when you don't have any kids. You're not going to be a very big nation when it's just you and your wife, right? Uh, so, you know, but God, tr uh, Abraham trusts in the promise, and he goes. You, you know, I need at least one kid, because one kid can have more kids, and then they can all have kids, whatever. But I need at least one. So at age 100, by a miracle, Abraham has a son named Isaac. It's the promise of God. It's the dream. It's being fulfilled. It's coming true. How glorious. But then one day, as Isaac is growing into a young man, God comes to Abraham and says, you know what, Abraham? I want you to sacrifice your son Isaac to me. And get what that is? He says, I want you to kill your son in a ritual act of worship of me. And it just, you, you know, we really, it just seems so unheard of. It seems so brutal. It seems so bloody. It seems so senseless. You can just imagine Abraham pleading with God, why? Why, God? Why, why would you ask me to, to kill my son? The son, you, you, you gave me out of a miracle, and now, now you want me to kill him? Why? This makes no sense. This is a test. Genesis 22 tells us it's a test. He actually says that. God knows what he's doing. God is testing Abraham. God is not a cruel God. He's not a capricious God. I mean, he's not just, God just does willy, things willy-nilly and without thinking. He, he's not a mean God. He's testing Abraham. And Abraham seems to know a little bit about who God is and that he is not a mean or vicious God. And so he's going to obey God in this, knowing that, that God is going to do something about it because he knows he doesn't worship that, that other kind of God, right? But he knows God. This is the ultimate test. Does Abraham really believe God is as good as all that? Because Isaac represented everything God had given Abraham. Isaac represented the promise. Isaac represented the dream. And if Isaac died, then there goes the dream. There goes the promise. There goes the great nation. Now, we, we look at this from the outside. All these years later, we read this account of Scripture. We're kind of separated from it. So we look at it, but we, we still look at this and we read this and we look at what God is telling Abraham to do, and we think, well, that's not fair. It's not fair. Do you ever say that about life? 
it's not fair. You know, of course, we, we all do it. You know who's excellent? Who, you know, experts at saying it's not fair? Kids, <laughs> right? I got three kids in my house. The oldest brother, Caleb, the older brother, gets to stay up half an hour later because he's older. It's not fair. Oh. You know, Leah, you have to go to bed tonight because you can't, you're so tired you can't even hold yourself up. You have to go to bed early tonight. Oh, it's not fair. Jaina gets just one extra sausage link on her plate at dinner time. It's not fair. Kids are experts at saying it's not fair. Guess what? So are we. We say it all the time. This isn't fair, right? Let me tell you something. Here's a secret. I had to go through seminary in order before they finally told me this. Life's not fair. Yeah, you know. We know that, right? I mean, we know myself. Why do we pretend or think that it should be fair? I, I mean, it's not fair. This isn't life in heaven. This is life on earth. You know, in heaven, everything is done according to God's will. So everything is fair. Everything is just. Everything's great. Life on earth. Wow, we're messed up here. That's why when the disciples come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, teach us how to pray. One of the things he teaches them to pray is, God, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because in heaven, it's all fair and just. And on earth, it's just messed up. Don't we want things on earth as it is in heaven? Heaven. No, earth is just messed up because it's full of sin and sorrow and pain because it's full of your choice. And you do things that aren't fair. Oh, we don't like to say that. I do things that aren't fair. And so does everybody else. And so we have this world where things just aren't fair. You know, God can make things fair real fast, real easy. Just take away our freedom of choice. We don't want that, do we? It's not fair. We look at what God is asking Abraham to do or telling Abraham to do. And it's not fair. We're shocked. How on earth could God ask Abraham to do this? Sacrificing Isaac just doesn't make any sense. This is a senseless loss in Abraham's life. But, but you heard what happened when I read you the account from, from Genesis 22. God tells Abraham, sacrifice Isaac. So uh, Abraham takes Isaac, and they go on a journey to, to go sacrifice to God. And when they're on their way, Isaac kind of says, uh, Dad, we got the wood, right? And you have to burn the sacrifice when we're done. But, you know, where's the sacrifice, Dad? And Abraham, you know, look at his faith already. He says, God will provide. You know, I'm actually saying it through, through choked sobs, right? God will provide. Because he's taking his son, right? And so they get to the, the place of sacrifice. And imagine your Isaac at this point as Abraham places the wood. And then he takes you and kind of puts you down. Maybe ties you down there. You know what's coming, don't you? I mean, you figured this out. Now imagine your Abraham. Anyone who's ever had a special kid in their life knows how, how just heartbreaking it would be to tie him or her down on this wood. And, and it's useless to try to escape. It's pointless to resist. And, and you know how, how gut-wrenching it would be to take the knife and to hold it up and to plunge it down on that child? I, I mean, this, this, is, this is horrible. But Abraham does it. And just before the blade hits that kid, the angel of the Lord calls, Abraham, stop. It's a test, and it's over. And at that moment, Abraham looks up, and he sees in the brush, in the thicket there, a ram, a sheep, caught. God has provided, just as Abraham had trusted so the sacrifice isn't Isaac, but a sheep caught there. It's astounding that Abraham was able to do this. Jim, show us, please. Uh, Hebrews 11. This is what Hebrews 11 says about this, starting in verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him. Again, the Bible's telling us twice. This is a test. Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I, I mean, this is one of the most gripping stories in Scripture. Abraham is trusting in the goodness of God. Trusting that God is going to provide a way out or way beyond, a way after. 
and, and we look at this story, you know, we're sophisticated Christians thousands of years later, right? Oh, we're so smart in the 21st century. We know there are multiple layers of this story going on. I mean, there's, there's actually what's happening in that day and age, but we also know th th this kind of means something. So, uh, you know, God is, tells Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, and, and that's it, but there's other things going on. We know that, that already God planned thousands of years before Abraham was born what he was going to do. God had already known that he was going to provide a lamb there for Abraham to sacrifice. But God is also providing that lamb there as a symbol, as a metaphor, as an illustration for us for the fact that a few thousand years after Abraham, God was going to send the Lamb of God, His one and only Son, Jesus Christ. And God would sacrifice His Son. God would sacrifice His Son in the same way God is calling Abraham to sacrifice Isaac here. And he would do it for you. He would do it for me. He would do it for all who turn away from their sin and come to God for provision for the forgiveness of sin and eternal life. The seemingly senseless occasion just shows us that, that, that God is a God of love. He's not a God of anger or retribution. He's not waiting for you up in heaven, just waiting for you to mess up so he can get you. No. No. For those who love him and put their trust in him, he says, I will provide. I will provide a lamb. I will provide through this senseless loss. But you're going to be tested in this in your life. You're going to go through the Y test. You, you've maybe already been through a Y test like this. Maybe you're through it in it now. Maybe it's coming. It's going to be the most gut-wrenching test of your life. When God says, do you love the dream? more than me or do you love me God more than the dream God says do you trust me if you love the dream more than you love God then you've made the dream your idol you're failing the test do you love the dream do you love the promise more than you love the dream giver more than you love the promiser. That's the question. That's the test. Abraham passed the test. We look at this, and, and right, we look at this. How on earth did Abraham obey God in faith on this? And this is incredible. The Bible tells, tells us, hey, Hebrews eleven nineteen. 19, Jim's going to show us here. It says, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. So in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the death. It says that Abraham reasoned. He calculated. This is actually an accounting term. He figured in his head some things. You see, Abraham was such a man of faith that the moment God said, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice Isaac, Abraham knew it. From that point on, Isaac was dead. He was gone because Abraham knew that he would do it because God said. I mean, that's just amazing as it is. But what a senseless loss. But Abraham didn't just, from that point on, just kind of give up on all things, just say, why, oh, why, oh, why, oh, why, God? No, he reasoned. He reasoned about God. He calculated, he figured in his mind, he pondered the things of God. And when his focus was on God, he reasoned that God could raise the dead. He's reasoning, if God can give me a miracle kid when I'm 100 years old, then God can raise the dead. And this is what Abraham believed, because remember, he takes the servants with, the servants with him, and he says, you stay here. And he says, we will come back to you. He, 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 he's going, he's going to sacrifice Isaac, but he, he fully expects to come back with Isaac. Abraham figured, if this goes through, I know God can raise him back. He can give him back. That's the kind of God I serve. And ladies and gentlemen, these thousands of years later, that is the kind of God you and I serve. The God who can bring us back to life, so to speak, after we experience senseless losses. There are some things in life that just aren't explainable. You know, if you can explain everything in your life, then, then you don't need faith. And if you don't need faith, then you're in trouble because then God doesn't have a tool to test you, to grow you, to be more like Jesus. And so you're not becoming more like Jesus. We need faith. And here's the, the faith lesson for this week. Remember, we've been talking through these tests, and we learn a little bit more about faith. Faith is trusting God's purpose without knowing why. If we have faith, we, we trust God's purpose, even though we don't know why. You can't explain it. 
You just have to live through it. You just have to live it in faith. You've got to go through it. You know, when I became pastor here, oh, almost 10 years ago now, can you believe that? Um, I had a, God had given me like a dream for this congregation, right? I, I just dreamed that we would just come together and be so enthusiastic about coming and worshiping God together, and that would overflow into our, our love and care uh, of one another. We'd be carrying one another's burdens, and that would just overflow into us going out. I mean, people were just connecting with people in our community and drawing them in and inviting them and, and having them join us in worship and then joining with them in their new faith that they were finding in, among us and living with us, and, and it was just going to be great. It was this great dream. But we struggled with that for quite a few years, didn't we? We, we kind of sputtered along. And then, then we hired a full-time youth pastor. And the dream started taking shape, didn't it? I, I mean, we, we were interacting with people outside the church, people we just didn't even have any other connection with before. And, and, and people were, we were welcoming new people into the fellowship, and, and they were joining us for worship, and people were seeking God in new ways amidst us. The, the new people, and even some people who had been here a while, were seeking God in new ways. It was the dream. And then the unthinkable, cut-wrenching, things happened. And it was all just ripped from us. We lost all the new people. We lost some of the longer people, longer-term people. We lost our place, we lost our voice, we lost our testimony in this community, and it seems we still haven't gotten it back. I look around, and as, as far as I can see, I see all those young people we ministered to in that era, and they're not connected to faith, they're not connected to churches in any way. And some of the things, even this year, we as a congregation have endured, are indirectly and partly connected to all that mess. And you look around, you say, what a senseless loss. And so for four years, I've been saying, God, why? Why, God? It's not fair. It doesn't make any sense. You know what it is? You know what it is for us? It's a test of faith, right? Am I going to love God more than the dream? You know, because are we as a congregation going to keep clinging to what's left of that dream? Because that's what we love. Or are we going to love God deeply enough to let go uh, and embrace whatever future God has for us now, even though the future might seem not to make any sense? That seems to be senseless too. But will we let go of the familiar to trust God's purpose without knowing why? That's the question. Will we embrace what seems like senseless loss so God can grow us as individuals and grow us as a congregation? Because it's a test for us as a congregation, but it's also my test. It's my why test. It's been my why test for four years. And maybe that's your why test too. Maybe you have a why test that's completely different, something different that you got going in your life. And you're asking why, whatever it is. Remember this lesson we learned from Abraham today. If God can raise the dead, and ladies and gentlemen, everything we do and believe here is founded on the promise that God can raise the dead and does raise the dead. If God can raise the dead, then he can bring you through your senseless loss to a place of purpose. Today, if you're facing a senseless loss, stop asking why and start trusting in God's purpose. Let's pray.